So my first question was, um, just looking at your career, Keith, and, and, and the, prog the progression uh, from in, um, computer science at MIT, and then video games at Atari, and consulting and working with innovative technology, then going back and working on a degree in Chicago for, in psychology and education, uh, covered a lot of ground there, and also being a jazz pianist. Uh, where did the focus start to come in that your life's work was going to be focused on creativity? I first learned that there was something called creativity research when I was in graduate school at University of Chicago. I went there to study conversational dynamics and group dynamics. Uh, I discovered there was a professor there named Mike Csikszentmihalyi, the famous flow psychologist, and he had been a creativity researcher since the 1960s. Uh, at my very first term in graduate school, I took a course from him called Psychology of Creativity. And I was hooked, I was fascinated by this field. And we had to do a project for the course. And my project was to interview jazz musicians in the city of Chicago. And uh, he actually really liked my paper and suggested that I develop it and prepare it for publication in a journal. And that was my first published article uh, in 1992. So yes, that really got me hooked on creativity research because I, it's just a, a way to better understand this uh, deeply human phenomenon. Yeah, and well, and it sounds like pretty early in that uh, passion came this work with groups, and from which obviously sprang uh, Group Genius. And uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, what's really interesting to me is that you've taken some things that. Uh, some models for creative groups in, the, in the, the theater improv and jazz groups, but you have really had a broad application of them and using some, what those techniques are to help design groups, uh, task forces, committees of all sorts. Uh, how, how did that all evolve? At the core of my research is the study of conversation and how people interact with each other. That's what I went to graduate school to study. In fact, my dissertation for my PhD, I went into a preschool classroom, and I studied a classroom of 24, four and five-year-olds, their conversational dynamics as they were engaging in fantasy play, pretend play. Uh, so I developed a set of techniques, I call it interaction analysis, for trying to delve deep inside of what's going on in a group uh, when people are interacting, and in a way that's non-scripted, but basically it's everyday life, it's conversation, it's children playing. Uh, then I realized, well, this is a, a lot like what jazz music is like. It's musicians that are interacting musically. And uh, then I, again, sort of by accident, discovered there was this thing called improvisational theater, the same way I accidentally discovered there was a thing called creativity research, and I happened to be right there in Chicago. So I started studying this type of super creative group where the interaction is on stage and it's done for the benefit of an audience, but it has a lot of the same characteristics as any human conversation. Uh, it just happens to be a lot more entertaining and creative. So that's the exciting thing about it is that it's all conversation and it's all basic skills that everybody has of just interacting and connecting with other people but the improvisational theater, the same as the jazz, it, basically it's a heightened example of the super creative example of something that we all do every day. So if I could capture what it is that makes them great, then I feel like I could help every team and group be more creative. How do teams react to that? Because in a way, you know, when we think about great bands or great groups that find this formula that's magical, it feels like every single person is tailor-made and perfect for that. A lot of our groups that we meet with every day in communities and in, in businesses, you know, you don't get to pick everybody like saying, well, we're going to get this person to be in this group. Or Sometimes there are groups that just have to, to get good whether they're hand-picked or not. How, how, how does that, how do some of the things that great groups do help not-so-great groups? Right, that's one of the aspects of my research is to try to identify the difference between good groups and less effective groups. 
and in particular creative groups and groups that end up not being creative. And if you're thinking about you know, what sort of people get along well together, well that's a very common experience of musicians is that even when you're all great musicians, some of them you connect with better uh, and some of them pl play in a way that you just uh, like. Or the same way you may all be good conversationalists, but you might not be friends with everybody who's a good conversationalist. So to some extent, I think it really helps if, uh, if you have some flexibility in choosing the members of your group. But there's a lot of research that shows that uh, if you can develop that trust and a certain degree of familiarity, and on top of that, if you all share a commitment to the same goals, uh, that you're on the same page and you all are committed to what you're doing in a group, those three things, that the trust and the commitment to the same goals and the familiarity, those three things can enhance the effectiveness of any group. I find this fascinating. Uh, here we are at Conecco, and we're so glad that you're here with us for this series of programs. So much of what goes on in an open space like this and the, by design is collaborative. Uh, whenever you talk about community and crossing from one field into another field and combining people from different fields, you're talking about developing language that can kind of bridge those things and kind of create strong partnerships. Um, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about your experiences in uh, visiting places like this or, that are sort of starting to emerge more and more around the world. Um, what do you think about this uh, nonprofit or private uh, attempts of organizations to do this sort of thing outside of big institutions? Well, I think Coneco is an example of, it's a movement that's taking place all over the United States and really all over the world. It's this idea that if we can create a certain kind of open and collaborative space, that we can bring people together uh, to make everybody uh, better than they would be alone, right? where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So what you get is you get an environment where people encounter other people they might not normally connect with. And you have that unexpected exchange of diverse information. And we know from creativity research that that's the source of big insights, is bringing together those different ideas. So a place like Coneco is designed to maximize the collaboration of a city or a region, and I'm very excited about that.